the late 1990s, or should I say mid to late 1990s, <clears throat> there was a lot of resurgence going on at that time. A lot of comebacks, reunions, one breakup, one long-awaited album from the one metal band that everybody worshipped. And some movies that made a comeback, too. How's it going, old schoolers? You are kicking it old school. I'm your host, Russell J.S., I'm doing a special segment now on kicking it old school because I got to keep the videos going so I could go ahead and break out what I would call the 100th video of kicking it old school. Now, I know what you're thinking if you as you go on this channel, you see that I've got more than 100 videos. Well, that's because I added the weekly narc with Russell JS on there. And, you know, it's like I... You know, I'm trying to put out as much videos, much content as I can with Kicking It Old School and the Weekly Narc. But, you know, with two jobs and a lot of things going on in my life and over everything that happened almost two years ago, and I can't believe that debacle with my daughter's mom, that was almost two years ago. It feels like it happened yesterday. But this segment, I am calling this... Movie sequels that didn't get the fair recognition they deserved. Now, what do we think about when it comes to a sequel to a movie? How it becomes a franchise and, you know, the one, the first movie was such a big hit that they had to go ahead and, you know, the producers and the writers, the directors and the stars, they thought, hey, we got a big hit. What happens if we make another one? We can make it even bigger and, you know, you know, bigger and see if we could top it. Some had been able, like The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. And, you know, some haven't. And that's why I want to, I mean, some of these sequels I actually really enjoyed. And, you know, I'm also going to do, like, maybe reboot movies as well. Well... As always, if you're new to the channel, you know, feel free to hit a like, subscribe, and leave a comment in the box below. And also tell your friends, you know, like, tell your friends about, you know, that love to kick old school. And if you know somebody, if you are or you know somebody that's being victimized in a narcissistic friendship or relationship, you know, watch the videos I have on that too and show that to friends you may have or family members you may have that are stuck in the situation. Okay, so the movie sequel, I was just, as I brought up to, you know, the beginning of the, this, this video, how uh, certain comebacks were coming around. You know, Kiss reunited with the original band of Gene Simmons, Paul Stanley, Ace Fraley, and Peter Chris. The Sex Pistols did a one-time tour with original bassist Glenn Matlock. Um, let's see. The Ramones did one more tour, did a farewell tour in 96, and they called it quits after 20-some years, 22 years. Of touring and recording. Um, let's see. We had that short-lived reunion of Van Halen with David Lee Roth. Where they only did the two songs with him for the be first best of. And what else? Uh, Black Sabbath would headline on the OzFest with the original members with Ozzy as the front man. Blue Oyster, bands like Blue Oyster Cult kept on touring. Jimmy Page and Robert Plant twice would give us... would They'd somewhat to a certain degree, but they wouldn't give us the full reunion of Led Zeppelin that we always dreamt about. They did an um, MTV Unplugged kind of thing. They called it Unleaded. And then they did an album in 1998 called Going Into Clarksdale. 
But this one movie in particular that came out in 1998 that it did not receive well from get received well from the critics. It had a short life at the movie theater, and I had to wait pretty much almost a pregnancy for this to come out to video. I saw it at the theater twice. And we had it at the theater I worked at, and it only lasted a week. But I really enjoyed it, and you have to be a fan of the original to really appreciate it. The movie I'm talking about from 1998, Blues Brothers 2000, starring Dan Aykroyd and John Goodman. In this movie, now, if you haven't seen it yet, I suggest you turn this video off. You know, try to find it at your local public library, stream it on all the main sources like Hulu or Netflix or, you know, pay-per-view, whatever you can find it on and watch this movie because there's going to be spoilers. What this movie entails and one of the things when it begins, they did a really moving tribute to John Belushi, Cab Calloway and John Candy who were at the time the only actors from the original movie that had passed away. And, you know, like, it starts out where Elwood Blues, 18 years after the original movie, is paroled from prison, which, by the way, they also got John Landis back at the director's helm with, with somebody else helping, Leslie Belsberg. And it was written by Dan Aykroyd, Leslie Belsberg, and John Landis. And they also have it where it's based on the Blues Brothers, written by Dan Aykroyd and John Landis. What this movie entails is Elwood is paroled from prison after 18 years. Wow, all the chaos he caused in the first movie. Boy, the judge really was harsh on... The judge threw the book at him back in 1980, I guess. And what happens is... Elwood is paroled from prison. And he's standing outside the prison gate, waiting patiently. Sets his, brief, his signature briefcase down. Watches cars from this side to the other side passing. Hoping that his brother Jake is going to be there to pick him up like he did for him years before. <clears throat> but what happens is, he's there for 24 hours. Love my sweet tea. He's there 24 hours, and not realizing the warden, played by Frank Oz, he sees him on the security cameras, and he asks the guards if they told him about Jake. And nobody had said anything to him about Jake. So the warden goes outside to tell him that his brother Jake, while he was in prison, had passed away. Now, they never tell you how Jake passes away. I'd like to speculate that he got paroled out of prison earlier before Elwood did. And the Carrie Fisher character caught up with him and blazed him with bullets, finally. She got her way. For, you know, for what happened before. <clears throat> and some people will say maybe he died the same way his real-life counterpart died. We all know two years after the original Blues Brothers came out, John Belushi died of an overdose of cocaine and heroin in his hotel suite in Hollywood at the age of 33. But, um, but yeah, so he's picked up by somebody who works for a friend of his, which is his old drummer from the original Blues Brothers band, offering him a job, but what he's interested in at that point, he wants to get his life together. First off, he sees a used car lot that specializes in selling used police cars and used taxi cabs, so you know what, that's going to happen right there. And then he goes to visit the Penguin, and... She's happy to see him, and she offers her condolences on Jake. And come to find out that their mentor, the janitor at the orphanage, he comes to find out that the orphanage is gone. The father-like figure Jake and Elwood had, Curtis, he passed on along with Jake as well. 
So now, Jake's gone, Curtis is gone, and the orphanage is gone. The Penguin is working at a Catholic hospital that's housing young orphans. So the Penguin asks Elwood to mentor a young boy named Buster. And she tells a story about Curtis. About how he had a band years, many years ago that toured all the juke, jink, juke joints of the Midwest. In one of those towns, he had an affair with a married woman. And she became pregnant. And the boy never knew about Curtis. But the mother did. And her husband, who was away in the military, had raised the boy as his own. So what happens is, Elwood, against the Penguin's wishes, sets out to find this boy. Come to find out he's, an Ill he's a commander in the Illinois State Police. And he thinks, okay, he could be Jake's replacement. Played by Joe Morton, Commander Cable Chamberlain, he's reluctant. He just thinks that Elwood is just a deadbeat criminal who was just paroled from prison. And Elwood was trying to see about him loaning him $500 to buy a car. And there's a whole big mess where all of a sudden, Cab, Cab is all of a sudden interested in Elwood. Come to find out that Elwood found a way to get to his wallet, took $500 out, and bought what would be the new Bluesmobile, which instead of a 1974 Dodge Monaco... Mount Prospect City Police Car. It was a canine unit, 1990 Ford LTD Crown Vic. So he's taking Buster on the road, and he finds out where Willie works, which Willie owns his own strip club. And he's reluctant to get the band back together. But after gangster Russian gangsters, he, see, here's where the chaos starts to commence once again for Elwood. Elwood manages to make mad the Russian mafia. So they're going after him. They torch Willie's club. And what happens is also Elwood meets a bartender named Mac, played by John Goodman. And he makes a deal with Mac to help him on something, and he would let him sing the next time around. And Elwood comes to find out, you know, the house band, Mac singing. Mac can sing. So he's like, okay, you're going to be the replacement for my brother, Jake. So what happens is the gangsters torch down Willie's club. And they go ahead and get Max fitted with the signature black suit with the hat and sunglasses. Same thing with Buster. And they set out to go ahead and get the band back together. Reluctantly, the band members, once again, are going to go ahead and join the band, and then all the chaos, I mean, it's, you know, it's just as funny as the original movie. That's all I'm going to say. I mean, you got the Russians, you got neo-Nazis, you got Illinois State Police, Indiana State Police, and sheriffs, to, you know, all wanting to get Elwood. And the hijinks just go on and on, and you've got, once again, you have another who's who of blues and R&B. I remember when I saw when I saw, like, all the cameos, like, you know, you had Eric Clapton with Bo Diddley and Clarence Clemens and uh, Steve, you know, Steve Winwood, Billy Preston, um, you know, like, a whole ensemble, B.B. King. And, I mean, it's a great movie. It went unappreciated. Like I said, I saw the movie twice at the theater. And I had to wait nine months for it to come out to video. Because back in those days, in 1998, you had to wait a certain amount of time for movies to be produced on VHS after they'd been at the theater. And sadly, this sequel, it went unappreciated by the critics. And I give it an A for effort because you know why? Dan Aykroyd is keeping the legacy of John Belushi alive in this, along with touring with the Blues Brothers Band and everything. You know, got his blessings from Judy Belushi, got his blessings from Jim Belushi, 
I mean, Jim Belushi, from what I heard, was going to be in it, but he had another project he had to commit to. But one thing I can say is if you can either find a copy of this movie, yeah, this is my VHS copy. If you can find a copy of this movie on Blu-ray or DVD, or you can find it on Hulu or Netflix or all the other movie streaming, you know, web, interweb, you know, sites... Give this a watch. Give it a chance. I mean, I'm telling you, I laughed hysterically at some of the hijinks. Some of the scenes were cool, you know. And it really does pay homage to the late, great John Belushi. Well, this is a new segment that I'm doing. I hope you enjoyed it. Like I said before, feel free to, you know, subscribe. Leave a comment. And, you know, leave a comment. <clears throat> Don't be too harsh with me on the comments. <clears throat> and ring the bell for notifications. Hit a like. And tell all your friends. Tell all your friends about Kicking It Old School and, you know, and the Weekly Narc. I've got... I mean, I've got something special planned for what the 100th video of Kicking It Old School is going to be. So I'm working on pushing content out. I'm doing it slowly but surely. But there's going to be some more content ahead where I'm going to discuss, you know, old record albums and things like that. Well, this is your old pal, Russell J.S., going to sign off, wanting to remind you to keep it cool, keep it chill, live life simple, get you enough, get you enough of anything you desire, love, uh, less drama, you know, anything your heart desires, get you enough. And remember, keep it real, stay chill. And this is your old pal Russell J.S., as always, wants to wish you Godspeed, and may the Force be with you, always.